I consider it both a challenge and a pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. He's an individual that dares to be different. He's also an individual that has felt compelled to speak out on some of the issues, particularly on the structure of our society and the education system that it perpetuates. I think most of us in one form or another are connected with the educational system. Some of us as teachers, others as students, and others as parents. I think frequently we attempt to assess the quality of certain facets of education. At the same time, I think we fail to take a, a long-run view of the overall system. We look at the quality of teaching. We use teacher evaluations. We look at various components like the way Spanish is taught, but never at the overall educational process and what is taught in that process. Jonathan Kozal, like Thoreau, I think, has become an advocate for freedom, for conscience, and for dissent. I think he feels that these attributes are not taught in our public schools and that the school system is failing for that reason. The system is attempting to indoctrinate instead of trying to make an individual cognizant of his surroundings and of the problems. Now you might ask, how did Jonathan Kozal come to this point? I think educationally he came through a very proper education. He graduated summa cum laude from Harvard University with an A.B. in English. He was later a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University. And I think his educational process probably began in his teaching experiences. He was a fourth and fifth grade teacher in the public school systems of Boston and Newton. He later was education director of the Storefront Learning Center, an alternate school for three years. He's been a visiting instructor at Yale University. And he's been a visiting lecturer in education at a number of schools across the country, including Iowa State at one point. His publications, I think, are well known to most of you. Death at an Early Age, which won the National Book Award in 1968, was really a critique of his experiences as a teacher in the Boston public school system in the poorer urban section of the city. He followed this with Free Schools in 1972, which was a look at the problems in establishing free schools and what the free school system might accomplish. His latest book in 1975, The Night is Dark and I Am Far From Home, has been really a critique of the whole educational process going beyond the one school format and looking at the bigger problems and bigger issues in terms of what the educational system accomplishes. He's published a number of essays on education in a number of prestigious publications. He's also won or held a Guggenheim Fellowship at one point, Ford Foundation Fellowship at another point, and Field Foundation Fellowship. It is now time to introduce this individual, I think, who challenges our imagination who stimulates our creativity in the educational process and who rekindles in us the independent spirit for individuality in our educational process. On behalf of the University Honors Program and the Committee on Lectures, it is a pleasure to present Jonathan Kozo. Terrifying. Well, I don't know. I, I'm trying to. S I'm short, so it's hard to see you. Not as short as Truman Capote, but pretty short. Anyway, <laughs> fortunately, not that short. Um, I always like to begin with a text from someone else because, as some of you may know, if you read the critical reviews that I regularly receive for the books that later win prizes, um, <laughs> um, I'm always accused, every time it's happened, of being well-meaning, earnest, ethical, outlandish, but um, overstated, and they always say that 
I don't have good documentation for what I have to say, that, that I'm outrageously uh, you know, reckless, and I only quote from, from dishonest sources, by which they mean socialists. <laughs> so I'd like to begin by quoting, and, and, and they always say, I'm preachy, preachy, preachy. Funny word, isn't it? And they always say that, preachy. And I like that. This morning, I, I, I gave this sermon in, in a, uh, or well yesterday morning, I gave a sermon in, in a Unitarian church in Chicago. So I really preached there. I <laughs> like to be preachy. But the, the thing is that if, if you're preachy, you have to have a gospel. Or you have to have a text for the for the lesson. So here is here is the gospel for today, <laughs> tonight. You know. I just came upon this recently. I thought it was fine. I'm quoting now. I don't want to be arrested, so I want I have to say that clearly. One of the difficulties, as I see it, is that we worship money instead of honor in this nation. A billionaire, in our estimation, is much greater in the eyes of the public than the public servant who works for the public good. It makes no difference if the billionaire rose to wealth on the sweat of little children and the blood of underpaid labor. Sounds so communistic, doesn't it? No one even considers the Carnegie libraries steeped in the blood of the homestead steel workers, but they are. We do not remember that the Rockefeller Foundation is founded on the dead miners of the Colorado Fuel Company, but they are, but it is. We worship mammon till we get back to the fundamentals of justice and the giver of the tables of the law, these unjust conditions will remain with us forever. That's from one of my favorite Marxist authors, Harry Truman. <laughs> it's from a book called Plain Speaking by Merle Miller, Collected Speeches of Harry Truman, 1973, Putnam. You want to check it out. Because you, you should check out people like me, you know. <laughs> anyway, I look out at this room tonight, and I, I say to myself, good God, this is the spring of, what year is it? <laughs> 1977, and I, think, you know, it was six years ago that Time magazine told us that the movement was over, and it was about four years ago that Newsweek told us that the kids in America had lost all their human passion and compassion, their teachers were only interested in tenure, and the, and the, and their, the kids were only interested in making it to med school so they could earn $60,000 a year, and uh, you know, uh, I wish they were here tonight to see uh, that there are a couple more than a dozen people in the state of Iowa who still seem to care about justice. I uh, really feel excited when I see this because I think you'll only find that at Ann Arbor, Michigan, or Madison, Wisconsin, or Berkeley, or Harvard. You know they found it at Harvard, <laughs> but they think so. And they don't know that here in the heart of America, in the middle of America, in the, in the part of America that produces the food we eat, and in a deeper way, the conscience that we live by, uh, 500 600 people turn out on a night to hear a 
miserable night to, to hear somebody they know dissents from the American way of life and wants to force his argument home. It's almost enough to make you believe in America. <laughs> At least we've got our civil liberties, and by God, let's use them. Well, I could talk tonight a little bit if I wanted on race integration in Boston because that's a big issue for many of you and I will if you force it and you know, push it at the end questions and uh, later on it's going to be around for a while or basic skills versus open schools which is another big issue in this country or my recent trip to socialist Ch uh, to, uh, to, to uh, socialist Cuba but I I'm going to refer to that briefly, but not, not at length. I'd rather focus on my new book, The Night is Dark, and to a lesser degree in my first book, Death in Early Age. I'd like to try to show why it took 10 years for me to write the second book, which is another way of saying why it took 10 years for me to grow up. The first book was an easy bestseller because it was a sweet and loyal protest against unjust conditions. And it was the sort of thing with which almost nobody could object. Even Barry Goldwater had to admit that it really wasn't nice to whip black children in the basements of decrepit slum buildings in Boston. He never said that he agreed with me. I, we never used him in our advertising, but um, I think even Barry Goldwater is sort of a crook, but um, sort of a clean crook, um, probably would have agreed that, that that was a legitimate argument. But now it's tougher because now we're talking, I am at least, in tougher issues. And I have to apologize to start with because they're in this group tonight, this audience, a handful of people who followed, followed me from speech speech. Uh, what's this thing for? I always, I keep wondering. It seems like a, this is the one that works, and I guess this is the one that goes to the Justice Department. So, <laughs> turn it on the but, um, but anyway, to those of you who are loyal enough to follow me from speech to speech, my beloved masochist comrades. Um, pl please forgive me if I say in the beginning a few things that I've said before in St. Paul and Ann Arbor, Detroit, points I've made before and even statements I've made before because I can't assume that everybody here knows all of my life's work to their great regret, I'm sure. But, uh, <laughs> I wish they had already read everything I've ever written, but I assume that, that most people here don't know nothing about me. Why should they? Um, so I'm going to start with a few minutes of autobiography, and then I'm going to come up to the present and see what we can do about the country that we live in right now. Well, I started out in very peculiar way as a teacher. I didn't go to a school, to a college, where they taught you how to teach English, for example. Instead, the best, the closest you could come was to major in, in English. So you could learn to love literature, but they never gave us a chance to learn how to sell bad literature to children in the public schools. Um, which would have been the, what I would have got if I, you know, I'd been in a school of education. And as a result, when I got to the point of wanting to teach in Boston, I didn't have credentials. I had my degree in English from Harvard, but I didn't have a degree in education and, and salesmanship. Really, I think they should combine the Harvard School of Education and the Harvard School of Business Administration. And um, we, you know, the teachers could sell better and the businessmen could learn more. 
Um, but I went in just at blank as a sub. And you know many of you what that is like. I mean, I know there are a lot of disappointed Easterners here. Yeah. And uh, what ha happens essentially is that if you, if, you, if you can just show any kind of college credentials, any sort, you just flash something in front of them. It could be a fishing license. <laughs> uh, the higher you, if you're willing to teach in the, what they call the deprived communities, they mean black or poor neighborhood, poor white neighborhoods, and that's true in Boston, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, most of the eastern cities. So I just went in, in a decade back, more, more than that, 60, 64, and I said I would like to teach. I'd worked in the summer with, with kids teaching reading, and I, I felt sad when September came and I felt I was losing my students. To, so I went in and I said, I'd like to teach. And here's my degree, blank, and my grade record, or whatever it was. And all I had to do was show them. They didn't even look at it. They just, they just handed it back to me and flipped off a little switch on, on something. And then they said, well, are you a member of any of these organizations? And they passed me a list of 300 organizations, 300 subversive organizations, which I studied really carefully. And I wasn't a member of any, but I jotted down the addresses of <laughs> six because they sounded great. And, um, and then, and then, and, and I said, no, I'm not a member of anything except the Harvard Alumni Association. I promised to quit as soon as, as soon as, as, soon as you demand. And, and so they hired me. And, and then I went into what is called basic training for a sub. Now this was hard for my, my father. I'm speaking kind of kind of personal terms because my relationship to my folks is very close, and my dad suffered deeply, as you may well imagine. For uh, he still suffers deeply. He's suffering tonight. You know? <laughs> I mean, he suffers that I'm his son, and 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 he suffered terribly because he thought, my God, I worked so hard to send my boy to Harvard and Oxford, and before that he sent me to an Episcopal prep school for several years, uh, which I integrated. I was the first Jew they'd ever had in a hundred years, <laughs> uh, and that school had only existed for a hundred years. And, um, and, and he was upset that this was what I'd chosen for my destiny. He said, son, what are you going to do now that you've completed your preparation? And I said, I'm, I'm going to be a sub. <laughs> and he, and he, he said, but you could be Senator Fulbright at the least, <laughs> Dean Rusk at the most. History will absolve me, Father, I wanted to say, but I didn't have the courage or the prophetic power to say that, and so I only pleaded with him that it was maybe worthwhile just to work with poor children for a couple of years, and he couldn't argue with that. So I went in, and after six weeks, which were really hard, really terribly hard, <laughs> have many of you done that as a sub? You know, where they send you, today you're teaching kindergarten. I know nothing about early childhood education, zero. And they sent me into a little kindergarten class and all these little gerbils, like, <laughs> but, well, I didn't know what to do with them. They crawl all over me, hug me, kiss me, punch me, bite me. And then the next day at 6.30, quarter seven, I get a call saying, you're teaching 
seventh grade geog. Uh, and I go in and teach that, and the next day it's tenth grade Latin. <laughs> and I hadn't studied Latin since I was in school myself. Uh, uh, I barely remembered it. And, well, but I survived those six weeks. I would not give up because I really wanted to get into that system one way or another. And finally I got my reward. After six weeks, they, which is really their, their, essentially their period of basic training, they, they gave me, they, they changed me from being a sub to being a, a permanent sub, <laughs> which is the substitute's version of tenure. And, and, and suddenly, I, I, had my, I had a class for a year, and I went in, and I was so excited, and I told my father, I'm a permanent sub, and he was, still wasn't impressed. Um, he took me out to dinner frequently that year, twice <laughs> and he sat across the table and he grabbed my elbow like that I don't know why the elbow maybe somebody here who knows more Judaic tradition would understand I don't know I always thought it was the thigh <laughs> that was the thing that, that Jacob had to touch so he could wrestle with the angel um, but my father went to the elbow and, and he grabbed my elbow. I remember that. And he looked at me across the table and he said, Son, are you all right? <laughs> it all made me feel so frightened. It scared me terribly. It's funny, but it's scary, you know, when your father, whom you trust, treats you as though you're a deviant. A sick person. My father's a psychiatrist, too. So. <laughs> so lots of jokes began to go around the s small town of Boston, which it really is. And there's an old Jewish expression which translated into English goes like this. The shoemaker's children go without shoes. And I guess what they meant by that was, you know. <laughs> uh, so, but I, I was determined not to quit, and I got a permanent position. And then once I had my permanent position as a permanent sub, I, I worked very hard. And in the early spring, the principal rewarded me by giving me my own class. Up till then, I had been an assistant to other teachers. And, uh, and in the spring, I was put into a classroom of my own, which had had 12 to 15 subs before I got there. I never could get an exact estimate on how many they really had, because the kids weren't sure. But the one before me, had been locked out on the fire escape in January. <laughs> and had, I had a mental breakdown. And he, it was a sad thing, you know. I don't mean to make fun of him, but it was awful for the children. They locked him out because they didn't like him, because they were angry. And, and they locked him out on the fire escape, and he banged at the window like rumpus. Stiltskin said, let me in, let me in. And they just said, ha, 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 we won't let you in. Because they were so angry by that. Because these kids had not only had subs all that year, but ever since they'd entered public school, they'd never had a permanent teacher of this group. That's all in, in my old original book, and I don't want to go on any longer. But the point is that when she sent me in, I was really facing a group of kids who were just you know, human dynamite, and he was so angry. She never would have let me have that class if it weren't for the fact that the, the man before me had ended in a mental hospital and she could not get anyone else to fill the class. So 
I went in, and amongst many other things, which we'll have a chance to discuss later, or at workshops, or other sessions while I'm here, the simplistic, obvious thing I did was, one, to put on my lapel the same button that I wore outside of school. These were black kids, and it was time of the civil rights movement, so I put on the same button that I wore on the picket line, which was an equal sign. Remember that little black and white equal sign? And, and uh, it, it's not so radical, after all. It's just like, just a button, uh, an equal, could be like new math or something. It, wasn't very, it didn't say freedom now or freedom someday in the future, maybe. Just, but the principal came to me and said, it's a nice pin, but don't wear it here. I forget her for saying that. I'll never forgive her for saying that, old bitch. <laughs> a nice pin, but don't wear it here. What does she mean? Any place else except in, this, in the arena of American education, we can speak of justice. I, in front of my students, put the pin back on, and that was the first step. The second was, so I went over to, to Harvard Square, where Harvard University is, and I went into the books, there's a, a left-wing bookstore in Cambridge. Some of you maybe have visited it. It's called the Harvard Coop. And in the bookstore there, they had a book by Langston Hughes with his picture on the cover. And a handsome photograph, a handsome book. I knew nothing of Langston Hughes, which showed what I'd learned as a major in English at Harvard College. But I liked his face. He looked like a warm man. I flipped through it, and I liked some of the poems. I read one poem to that class of fourth grade children, because they had no black literature in their class at all, of any kind, any kind at all. They, they, they didn't have the, the innovative Scott Forsman reader, you know, they had nothing. And I was fired because of that. And that's sort of the end of the autobiography. The charge against me was not that I had read a poem by a black man, that, but rather that I had read a poem by somebody who was not on the list for fourth grade. They had these very rigid lists, and they said if you waited till ninth grade, it would have been okay, because Langston Hughes is a ninth grade poet. <laughs> God, God help him. Um, and just to show they weren't racist, because nobody would want to think that the Boston School Committee under Louise Day Hicks was racist in any way at all. They threw in a white poet, uh, one of our less radical poets, I think, Robert Frost. <laughs> and they accused me of reading a poem by Frost in my class, which was true. The poem was Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. All poems. And why would they criticize that? Because it wasn't on the list for the fourth grade. I remember a black man, NAACP leader, who was a friend of mine, said, Oh, all oh, poems. How insane. Frost was no radical. If he was, he sure did sneak his Marxist Leninist innuendos in between the lines with enormous skill. But the thing is, Frost was a sixth grade poet. I was teaching fourth grade. If I waited two years, it would have been okay. A black man I just quoted also made the comment that if Frost had known he had written sixth grade poetry, he probably would never have written it at all. <laughs> I think he's right. So I was fired and out for curriculum, the 
charge against me, and you, you know this if you've seen my first book, Curriculum Deviation, that was the official charge in the footnotes of my book, Deviation sounded so sinister, like I had done some, something sexual. I wish I had, you know, the, the whole year we, I worked so hard, I had no time to do anything sexual. It was terribly boring here in that respect, but it was sexual, it was, it was, it was curriculum deviation interpreted by the public as sexual deviation, and then within one week I was hired by the federal government to work for Upward Bound for curriculum development. crazy the way you earn your credentials in this society. You must know, some of you, I hope, Mark Twain's famous quote about school boards in the United States. I, I hope he didn't mean the local school board in Ames, Iowa, because I don't want to insult people head on. <laughs> um, but he probably meant a few school boards in Iowa. And all the rest of the country anyway. He said, he said, in, in the beginning, God created idiots. But that was, but that was just for practice. <laughs> when he got really good at it, he thought it was school board. You can exempt your own if you don't think it's fair. Anyway, I went and wrote a book about it. It was a very juvenile book, in my opinion, and that's why it became a bestseller, because it corresponded to the intelligence and taste of the American people. Um, death at an early age. And in that book, which is now being made into a film, I took the role of a little boy, saying essentially, gee whiz. This isn't very nice. It's rather medical school. And whenever people in the wealthy suburbs say to me, isn't it a shame that we can't teach better skills within the inner city, my answer always is satiric. It is a shame for them. It's not a shame for you, because if they could do it well, where would you ever get your maids and janitors? Instead, they would be competing with you, your kids, your husband, for your own jobs. Well, this is the kind of naive liberal approach that we took all through the 60s, and this, those who keep writing such books like John Holt, I suppose, will retain a certain mediocre following of people who like this kind of path. But the fact is that it's dishonest. Because the schools in the ghetto, when they produce a servile labor pool for the children of the rich, are not making a mistake. They are fulfilling the real function of the public school. And when schools out in wealthy suburbs, or even moderately middle-class suburbs, such as those which surround us here, just rural countryside schools, produce children who have the skills to carry on the wealth and power of their parents, they're not making a mistake either. I think it's about time for us to state a couple of blunt matters about our public schools tough and clear to one another. Face the risk that some people might get mad. The problem we face today within our public schools is not that they do not work well. The trouble is they do. It's not an error when public schools in rich suburban neighborhoods turn out a man such as John Dean, John Mitchell, Richard Nixon, William H. Westmoreland. 
isn't an error either when schools that serve poor children turn out a powerless labor pool of unskilled men and women. On the contrary, it is the historic function of public schools that serve the children of the rich or of the middle class to guarantee that they will grow up to inherit both the power and the money of their folks. It is the historic function of a school that serves the children of the poor to guarantee that they will grow up to be another generation of the poor as well. That's the Justice Department warning. <laughs> Well, none of what I've said is a surprise to your philosophers of education or those of you who have studied the words of the founders of our public schools, such as Horace Mann. Nothing I've said up to now can be a surprise to those of you who are familiar with, with those in Germany who, during the early 1800s, devised the kinds of public schools on which American schools were based. These men and women, Horace Mann is a good example, were quite straightforward. They were not evasive when they spoke of the real function of the public school in the United States. Horace Mann, if you're taking notes, I know some of you are. I feel sorry because I ramble so much, but um, if you're trying to make an outline, give up. <laughs> uh, screw it up before you have a chance. Um, Horace Mann was quite explicit if you want to check it out in a speech he gave to the Mass Board of Education in, 19, in 1844. And Woodrow Wilson made the same statements later about the class stratification function of the public schools. Let's be blunt with each other right now so that we can deal with this in a sweeping way and not in the kind of patchwork, band aid fashion of the Summerhillian wheat germ people who think that. If you can apply enough wheat germ to the wound, we will have a social revolution in America. Um, what is the function of public school in the United States? The honest function of the public school, as in every other modern and developed Western nation, is what we call, in, case in, in the case of countries we don't like, that is, socialist countries, state indoctrination, political indoctrination. Russia, you no know, question at all about saying this about Russia. Russia indoctrinates. China indoctrinates. Cuba, or indoctrinates, but in the double talk of our schools of education here in the United States, we don't use such vivid terms. Instead, we speak about the socializing function. It's as if it were some sort of benign amalgam of trust and love and truth and Elmer's glue that <laughs> sticks us all together as one people. The words are different function is the same. Twelve years of mandatory nationalistic education, self-debilitation, loss of individual conscience, loss of blood. What's the most obvious example of the uh, indoctrination that goes on in our schools? Well, I'm sure everybody knows what it is. If it isn't next to me, no, it isn't, thank God. Um, it's the Flag pledge. It's the simplest example of all. Many of you may not know that the United States is one of the few countries on earth which has such a ritual. In other countries, they do sing songs and anthems, but we're rare in that we um, insist that children start the school day with a pledge of absolute allegiance to one nation, undivided, or rather indivisible, Say it. children always get the word wrong. They say invisible, but <laughs> not that, which is probably true. Yeah. Um, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, did stand up, place hand on 
depart, raise their eyes to the flag, and swear this pledge of absolute allegiance. Well, first, since it's a sensitive issue, and there are few Republicans, I've been told, still in Iowa, <laughs> fortunately not many, which is a sign of heightened IQ in this part of the country. Um, let me make one thing perfectly clear. Um, I'm sort of an odd rebel because I don't hate the American flag and I don't hate America. I don't hate my father. God knows I tried, but I can't. He's a nice guy, decent man. I don't even hate the teaching of hard skills. To be quite blunt, if public schools cannot deliver the basic skills of math and reading and writing, they ought to give up shop and go in for macrame or something else. Couldn't go back and forth across the country as many times as I do without feeling enormous admiration for the teachers in this country. I mean the teachers who are fighting back. So I don't hate teachers either. That puts me in an odd role. I like America. I like our flag. I like teachers. I even like some principles, <laughs> too. And one superintendent. But so far as the flag is concerned, I like it enough so that I do not like to see it stained with lies. And the flag pledge is a lie from start to finish. We do not live in one nation indivisible. We live in two nations brilliantly divided by the passion, skill, and genius of our real estate advisors and the red line policies of the major banks of Iowa and Illinois and Massachusetts and every other major state. The flag pledge is a lie. Teachers who lead their children to recite that pledge are liars. And have got to deal with that hard and tough. Here and now, you either stop saying it, rewrite it, or fight like hell to make it true. Well, that's a simplistic example, and I, I don't want to deal with simplistic matters with a sophisticated audience, so let me get on to more subtle matters. I'm sure you all agree with me on that. <laughs> um, let's deal with something non-political. There's one who didn't agree, but that's his right. We live in a free country, and everybody has the right to be wrong. Um, um, Let's deal with English classes, where it doesn't seem like we're being political, but we are. In English, very often, well, what's the best way to describe this? Schools have, have, an, have a terror of the use of the first person pronoun, I, or even worse, first person plural, we, we, comradeship. Since you can't say we really until you have enough self of sen enough sense of self possession to so say I, they start with the first person. That's where they really go to work on you. So it's the first person I that they demolish in elementary schools, and you hear it all the time in grade school. I'm going to use a woman for an example only because it's usually a woman in third grade, second grade, thinking of. Say a child comes in, makes a very unkind comment to the teacher, something like this. Um, well, just anything. I won't give an example. Assume it's a day you're feeling bad, you're sick, you're sad, you've broken up with your lover, your husband left you, somebody you love died, and you feel up on the verge of tears, and a child um, attacks you and says to you, Miss O'Brien, do, do you use mouthwash before you come to school? And she says, not knowing, she doesn't know it's coming. She says, no. And the children all join in chorus and say, 
You should. If you want us to talk to you. And what does she do? Well, it's sort of a cliche answer, which I've heard all over the United States, even in the past year, so it's not outdated. It goes on even today. I always think of it as a kind of musical answer because it has a kind of rhythm to it. I always think of it as the old euphoric sing-song of the NEA. Um, the teacher goes like this. It's sort of a song. It, i got to get it. i got to get in key. Is, is that... Is that, any, is that any way to speak? Is there any way to speak to me? To dee, to dee, to da, to da, to da. You know, is there any way to speak to me? It's very musical. And, but the trouble is she doesn't say me. Instead, what you hear is this. Is that any way? Is there any way to speak to Miss O'Brien? The, the, the question is, where is she? It's as if she went out present and pulsating in a classroom, but locked up somehow with the chalk and chalk erasers back there or in the, you know, in a closet. Um, and in a moral sense, she is. That's the truth, because she can't say I. She can't speak for herself. You hear, you, you hear the same thing at the university, only it gets fancier. The higher up you get, the higher levels of alienation you achieve. So you use the third person in the classroom with the third grade kids. You get to the university, you can use the subjunctive. <laughs> you get to do your PhD at Harvard, you use the conditional. <laughs> I've been over there to the faculty club at Harvard since I lived in Boston once. Um, two years ago, to have lunch with a close friend of mine. Well, uh, I might as well be blunt. It's my fault. <laughs> and, um, we're having lunch, and the man at the ne table next to us is, is vehement, which is unusual at Harvard. People aren't usually vehement, and he's passionate, and little past, you know, and he and he's and he's got six of his best friends around him and what he's doing is he's pouring out a deep conviction that he's arrived at. And it's very hard to arrive at a conviction at Harvard because everybody there is so skeptical of you and there's so much cynicism in the air. You're afraid to come to a conviction, say I believe this. So instead of convictions, what you get usually instead are notions, or suppositions, or possibilities. And I always hear people saying, I had this notion about this or about that. And you can't get mad at somebody for a notion. You can't really disagree, because it's like Play-Doh. You know, it's mushy, and there's no way to fight against it. A very common, John Kenneth Galbraith is a perfect example he you know, he has a notion every Wednesday after tea. It's very, it's no, there's no investment in a notion. A notion is easy. He, he, he goes on John, on um, Bill Buckley's show and he says, I had this rather interesting notion last night about the price wave spiral. And nobody's going to punch him in the nose for that. Not even William Buckley. Uh, least of all. So, notions seem like such soft, funny, fuzzy things. Soft and easy. Can you imagine Malcolm X standing in front of you and saying, with all my heart, I will stand and fight behind this notion? <laughs> so, that's why you don't get many convictions at Harvard, but lots of notions. Here's a man, in this case, who's gone down to the basement ahead of time to get up his courage. He's had six straight, the, the bars in the basement at the faculty club there, he, he's had six straight sherries. 
to get his courage up. And he's ready to pour it out. And he's really going to evacuate his soul. And uh, he's got his six friends around him. And this is what you hear. That's what I wrote down. One might well ask if it could be described. It seems, at least within the bounds of reason, to propose, one might suggest, there is a certain learned body of opinion which believes, or could I think be argued by some fellows, it's as if you're in a whole room full of third persons. <laughs> no one has the courage to say, I, as my father, why do they talk that way? Why do they do that? I thought he'd know because he's a doctor. He said it's because of the food they serve. <laughs> I don't know. They're, in order to have the dessert, faculty club in Cambridge said lime sherbet, lime sherbet, green dessert. I always think of it as a dessert of alienation. I don't know, maybe you like it, you know, it's up to you, but I stick to chocolate chip or something else. <laughs> this is from a high school lesson I saw three years ago, instructions for term papers. I hope it doesn't scare you. I don't want to scare anybody. Instruction for term papers. That's a little more innovative, moderate. You will consult exactly 15 separate sources. Half books. Half periodical. <laughs> you know they couldn't have made it. 16, just for <laughs> easy division. <laughs> Take notes on four by six cards. Not three by five. And be prepared to present them on demand. This paper should have a clearly indicated, oh, this is the part I always find so hard to believe. This paper should have a clearly indicated beginning. <laughs> Middle. And end. <laughs> I was wondering how you could possibly avoid it. <laughs> As you work for an Iowa newspaper. I really <laughs> then the last line of the assignment is the one, of course, which makes the point. Do not use the word I except in the conclusion of your paper. So essentially, you can't admit that you were there to your about to leave the room. An awful lot of our education, vast amount of our academic dialogue reveals the same effete, sophisticated, and corrupt invalidation of our own soul. Not just the use of the third person, but also the conditional and also the subjunctive. Subjunctive, of course, is the verb form of hypothesis, as if it were, right? Conditional is the syntax of tangential possibilities. Third person is the pronoun of self-abdication. Together they constitute the ideal rhetoric of the man or woman whose hands are skilled. But heart is dead and conscience is in it. It is the ideal training for the Vietnam bombardier. And even worse for those clever men who sent him there. Somebody else did it, but not I. And the last example that I'd like to give that comes from a completely different field from history. A lot of people think History has become radicalized in the past few years and is completely different now that we've got all these innovative package systems from SRA and IBM and this same corporation 
uh, Westinghouse and so forth. But in fact, to be quite honest, it hasn't changed a bit. Um, black people pointed out to me recently, they said, you know, they've got all these new methods now for individualizing everything, but the content hasn't changed. In reading, for example, they say we used to have the Scott Forsman reader where we had, um, well, years ago, streets and roads. <coughs> Remember that? Streets and roads. And then there was a radical version in the 60s, which was called New Streets and Roads. And in the 70s, um, when they really went overboard, more streets and roads. Then they introduced the SRA Reading Lab, this big orange box, which would be brought into your classroom. The black man I knew said, in the old days, at least, you know, they taught racism to our class all in one group, all together. Now, with SRA, we have individualized racism. Every child gets it at his or her own pace. <laughs> so I don't think it's changed a lot, and I know by and large in the 80 schools I visited it hasn't changed a bit. They still start history with the uh, Egyptian civilization. They still start out by teaching us not the passion, struggle, exploitation, oppression, rebellion of a particular era, but it's, ne it's never anything as deep as that, the life of the common people. It's always three major contributions of each civilization, something like that. Three or whatever the favorite number of the author is. I always got three for some reason. Um, I don't know, I guess three was probably adopted by Allen and Bacon, or Houghton Mifflin as, as the number. So I got Fertile Crescent three times. I did, I did that three times in a row. You start out with the Egyptian walking sideways across history with his eyes somehow misplaced halfway between his nose and ear, um, with the endless deserts of sand behind him. And the Egyptian has three major contributions, and those three major contributions you have to learn and memorize and regurgitate the exam, and they are one, pyramids, two, crop irrigation, three, discovery of only two gods. It's the most important. Don't forget it. And Jews, the Hebrew civilization comes along, always one up even now on the Egyptians, and um, they improve on it a bit, and they discover they discover only one God. Christians come along and discover the right God. <laughs> Constantine comes along and makes the questionable decision to get himself converted, um, skipping some major periods of history, but I just don't have time to deal with tangential issues in Greek civilization. And after Constantine's conversion, the world slips into the period which seems kind of dark and gloomy. It seems like nothing much is happening for a little while, a thousand years. But textbook is addicted to this idea of progress, the march of progress, you know, inevitable progress. So you can't admit that progress has stopped. And instead of saying, you know, just people gave up, for a thousand years, it's different. Instead, they say, they sort of convey this feeling. I don't know how they say it. it everyone was just resting, <laughs> getting ready for something big. And then, with the efflorescence of the Renaissance and the Reformation, it all explodes, and suddenly you get. Martin Luther hammering out his message on the church door in a good, innovative, individualized manner. And all these little people, as the textbooks seem to say, rushing around northern Italy, painting frescoes everywhere they can find a space above the door, underneath the window. Then, more important, 
terms of the United States, transportation going to market progress, boats become ships, queens become generous, admirals become audacious, step forward to discover the new world. Now the founding of the early 